From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew. He says he's not going anywhere. President Biden forcefully and repeatedly saying that he will not drop out of the presidential race, conducting two interviews and speaking today with donors to deliver that message. The president also sending a letter to Democrats in the House with more now publicly calling on Biden to exit the race, including the top Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. This as the latest Bloomberg Morning Consult swing state poll brings Biden's best showing yet. We'll talk about Democratic deliberations ahead with Congressman Jake Auchincloss of Massachusetts. And NATO coming to D.C. this week. World leaders arriving for meetings throughout the week amid elections in the U.K., France and Iran. Jane Harmon will join us to discuss what is at stake. Welcome to the Monday edition of Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio as we begin with the race to the White House and President Joe Biden who continues to fend off criticism surrounding his age and mental abilities in the wake of last month's debate. Joining us now, Bloomberg, Saleya Mosin and Wendy Benjaminson. It's great to see you both with us here on this Monday. Saleya, he even picked up the phone and called into Morning Joe today on MSNBC to continue this full court press. A little more full-throated than what we saw in the George Stephanopoulos interview on Friday, but it doesn't seem to be quelling the uprising here on Capitol Hill. Lawmakers are returning today, and Joe Biden's anticipating a letter. He tried to head it off with his own letter. What are we going to hear from Democrats in Washington next? We've gotten snippets of it. Uh, Senator Mark Warner, a mm -hmm. senior Democrat in the party, or a senior senator in the Democratic Party, uh, put out a statement. It was really soft. It was really squishy, Joe. He just said that we need to move forward. How do we combat Trump? He did not say, I stand behind Biden. He didn't necessarily name Biden in this three-sentence statement. He just said the president needs, we need to support him and look forward. Mm -hmm. But he did not have an unequivocal statement that he still supports yeah. the, him as the top nominee. Well, we've got about, what, 10 now publicly or privately, and a big one just landed publicly, Wendy. Adam Smith, the top-ranking Democrat on the Armed Services Committee, says it is time for Joe Biden to drop out of the race. Pretty right. tough here. President's performance in the debate, he writes, was alarming to watch. The American people have made it clear they no longer see him as a credible candidate. How many more Adam Smiths do we get tomorrow? There, there may be more. I mean, Adam Smith may have given permission, if you will, for other Democrats to come out. And Adam Smith is not a headline-grabbing guy. He's not a big tweeter. He doesn't try yeah, to get attention. That. He's a put your head down and get the work done mm -hmm. and is very powerful as the ranking Democrat on House Armed Services Committee. So the day before NATO arrives to say, and he pulled no punches in his statement, to say President Biden needs to step down, mm -hmm. that was pretty forceful. He says... Uh since the debate, the president has not seriously addressed these concerns, and this is unacceptable. You've got a member of leadership here, or at least someone in leadership on an important committee like the Armed Services. Do we need to hear from a Hakeem Jeffries or a Chuck Schumer for this to resonate more? I think so. I don't think we'll know that the dam has broken until we hear from those two mm. uh, senior members of the party. Donors, meanwhile, are kind of threading the needle. They're all uh, speaking on background. No one wants to go on the record with what they think. And they're all kind of waiting because they realize sure. money can't push it. And as yeah. you said, uh, Joe Biden was on Morning Joe this morning. Mm -hmm. And he says he doesn't care what millionaires think. Well, that's right. And look, a lot of the refrain has been, let's wait for more polling. Let's give it a week, more polling. Well, some more dropped over the weekend. And it came from Bloomberg. Wendy is largely responsible for what we read <laughs> on the terminal. You're part of a team in, in editing this coverage, of course. Wendy, this is what the White House is emailing around today. Exactly. It's the counterintuitive story of the day. Joe Biden's best showing yet in a monthly poll that brings us all the way back to October. What did we learn? Well, what I should say is we had no intention of helping or hurting the Biden campaign not. or the Trump campaign in any way. And we were a little surprised to see this, uh, you know, this showing. This poll was in the field beginning July 1st which gave people four days from the debate to watch Biden campaign, to mm -hmm. watch him talk about things, to to try to make up for it. And 
he also campaigned in uh, Georgia and North Carolina the day after the debate, two of our swing states. And yet there and there he is showing up with only two points below Donald Trump across those seven swing states that are critical to the election. It was a bit of a surprise. So the question will become, is this an outlier or an important uh, marker here? Because we've only heard national polls Right. Until this one came out. But there were a lot of other things happening other than Joe Biden's performance. In exactly. This as well. Exactly. One of the things that may have affected the numbers on this poll is one that people may have turned off the debate before it got to bed. A lot of people said they watched, I think 75 percent of the respondents said they watched the debate. We don't. They may have said that because they wanted to sound responsible. <laughs> they may have yes, turned it yeah. off after 30 minutes. Then there was also the other things that were happening to Trump around the time we were in the field. This was the first swing state poll since he had been convicted of 34 felonies in New York State. Mm -hmm. This was the first poll on the first day we were in the field. The Supreme Court came down with a ruling that said that basically he had a get out of jail free card for any future criminal acts he might want to commit while he's president again. Um, his performance in the debate, while more coherent, according to our respondents was also filled with mistruths and lies and, um, you know, perhaps to some voters, scary things about what yeah. his second term would be. And that all factored into it as well. You just realize so much has happened in the last five minutes. Right. It's difficult to delineate. People have so many inputs right now. This is highly unusual, even though it's kind of our new normal. We did see and hear from the president over the weekend before the phone call uh, to cable news this morning. He talked in this case at a campaign office in Philadelphia. Here he is. Dark Brandon's coming back. He's here. Yeah. And guess what? In the next 120 some days or so, they're going to get a real good look at who Donald Trump is. Dark Brandon's coming back. Uh, let's see how that goes. One thing we did find in the poll was that double haters, a majority of double haters, uh, were concerned about his performance in the debate and thought that he should drop out of the race. How does he convince those people in the days ahead? Well, that's what we're hearing from a lot of uh, Democratic lawmakers, that he needs to, President Joe Biden needs to be out there in front of the American public so that they can see with their own eyes moments, unscripted moments, scripted moments, show mm -hmm. him leading. There's going to be a press conference on Thursday evening yeah. uh, with the, uh, after NATO, the meeting. Uh, and let's see if he takes questions from reporters, if he is able to spar with reporters and allows those moments to happen. If the White House keeps trying to control those moments, sure. voters will see through that. That's going to be the real test. Uh, you've got a sea of reporters, as they say, a forest of hands and no other world leader next to him. He does a lot of bilateral news conferences, not a lot of standalones here. We're talking about the Veep Stakes, of course. One week from today, we're in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. As we await uh, the Veep Stakes, what are we hearing about Kamala Harris in our polling? Because people were casting about to different governors around the country and the idea that Joe Biden could be replaced by many. But our research finds that no one comes close to Kamala Harris. Not close, although some the question we asked was if Joe Biden could not continue his campaign, which one of these people would you support against Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. And among Democratic voters, which is a slice really all that matters because Republicans aren't going to vote for that ticket anyway, Harris comes out with more than three quarters of Democratic voters saying they would support her to replace Biden. Part of that, even though she has been a not great campaigner in her time and mm -hmm. there is there are feelings about her that are legitimate or not legitimate, sure. um, but the, also she would inherit Biden's war chest, mm -hmm. his massive campaign war Just chest. Just practically speaking. Practically speaking. She also has the highest name recognition of sure. any of those respondents. But then you get into Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who today took herself out of the running as a replacement for Biden. Um, she got a majority. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg got a majority. And California Governor Gavin Newsom got a majority as well, although this could also be name recognition. Yes, sure. People have heard of cabinet members. Gretchen well, that Whitmer's means a lot at this stage of the race if you're starting late, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. It really, really does. So it makes sense that if Joe Biden doesn't continue the campaign, that he turned to his vice president. There you have it. Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson and Saleh Mosin. Fascinating conversation as we enter a new week with many questions about the direction of this campaign.
And as we mentioned, coming up, the NATO summit kicking off this week in Washington. Ukraine front and center. Jane Harmon, chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy, will join us next. For more on that, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The president's record speaks for itself, and the allies and the non-NATO uh, friends and partners that are coming as well, they know that. They wouldn't be coming, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, to a NATO summit if they didn't believe in American leadership and how important it is, and if they didn't believe that President Biden takes that responsibility extremely seriously. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby speaking to reporters today at the White House briefing as political leaders from around the world gather here in Washington for the 2024 NATO summit. This starts officially tomorrow, the group marking 75 years, in fact, since the founding of NATO in the wake of the Second World War. They'll do it here in the city where it began. Today, another crisis front and center, of course, with the conflict in Ukraine set to dominate the agenda, not to mention our own domestic presidential politics to that end, we're joined by Jane Harmon, I'm glad to say, the chair of the Commission on the National Defense Strategy. NATO coming to town, Jane, and we've got a lot of questions, of course, as we just outlined. There are questions about Joe Biden's relationship with these world leaders, as many here in the U.S. try to better understand the man they call president. And it strikes me that he's spent more time with a lot of these world leaders, particularly NATO leaders, on his trips to Europe and dealing with the matter of Ukraine than he has with a lot of Democratic House members. What do these leaders know that Democrats in Washington do not? Well, let's understand NATO came here at uh, President Biden's invitation, and I think John Kirby has it right. They're here for him, uh, which doesn't mean some people don't have doubts about his age. Hey, I'd like to be 20 years younger myself, uh, but you invited <laughs> me on your show, so there must be some reason why I'm still vital. Hello, Joe. Uh, but my point is <laughs> they're here uh, because he invited them, and they're here because this is where to celebrate the 75th anniversary in the Mellon Auditorium where it started. And that celebration is tomorrow night, then there's a dinner for heads of state yeah. Wednesday night. These are all Joe Biden performances. And then there's a huge conversation about Ukraine and also about uh, the, the buffer zone that the Biden administration has built in the Indo-Pacific to uh, ward against a potential, or to deter, let's put it that way, a potential Chinese uh, annexation of, of uh, uh, Taiwan. So these are all mm -hmm. good foreign policy successes. NATO would not be this strong, I will say this. Uh, NATO would not yeah. be this strong without Joe Biden's personal leadership over the last three and a half years. Well, he said that in a couple of interviews last couple of days as well. And let it be known that no one has ever questioned the vitality or spirit of uh, Jane Harmon. But while we're talking about this, Jane, you're a Democrat and I know you support Joe Biden. Uh, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this political storm that he seems to be in the middle of right now. But how does he leverage this NATO summit to appear presidential and vital? Well, let's watch. Let's see what he does. I mean, there were some appearances over the weekend, one in a, uh, a black church in Philadelphia where he looked pretty vigorous. I was on a call this morning or Zoom, and there he was, and he looked pretty vigorous. I mean, he is being tested, but guess what? It's politics. It's, you can't, <laughs> you gotta take a punch and you gotta be back. And he has taken a lot of punches in his personal and political life over the years. And mm. let's see what he does. I'm, I'm betting on Biden. Yeah. I think he's gonna be okay. I'm also seeing, and you discussed this in the last segment, that Kamala Harris's poll numbers are going up. Uh, polls are mm. early. It's, I think, 40 days before the convention. Uh, I, I think I've got that right. And 140 uh, days before the election. That's a lot of time to turn things around. Uh, I saw that in my own well, races. You know, right. Remember, I, a long time ago, I served nine terms in the House of Representatives myself. Yeah, you know a little bit about running for office. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg was asked about this. It was interesting to watch him dance around it on Sunday morning. He was very careful. But the NATO uh, Secretary General spoke with reporters about the war in Ukraine specifically. I want to get into some of the issues that NATO will be dealing with. Jane, here's what he said, and we'll talk about it. We will increase our support uh, to Ukraine for the long haul, reinforce our collective defense, and deepen our global partnerships. 
Our most urgent uh, task at the summit will be support to Ukraine. Ukraine must prevail and they need our sustained support. So at the summit next week, I expect heads of state and government will agree a substantial package for Ukraine. There's a lot of talk about Trump proofing at NATO, uh, particularly in the wake of this debate. Jane, as people try to imagine what a Trump 2.0 would mean for NATO, and there's an idea here that the alliance will resolve to take more responsibility for coordinating, for training uh, forces in Ukraine. Should that happen this week in Washington? Uh, yes, it should. And they should agree, which they are expected to agree, to send a package of, of not just uh, humanitarian aid uh, and, and some training pledges for Ukraine, but a package of hardware, uh, long-range, so-called long-range fires, air cover uh, for Ukrainian soldiers who've been fighting in trenches without it uh, for a long time. I think the Biden administration was too cautious and should have sent uh, a lot of things like attackums and Patriot systems mm -hmm. much, much earlier. Europe is going to step up and do that. Let me just say two more things about this. First of all, salute the decade of service by Jens Stoltenberg. He has been an exemplary head of NATO. He steps down soon, and, and the uh, head of Denmark, uh, Ruta, will take over. Everyone thinks he will be great. And, you know, salute Europe for, and NATO for, for a good pick. And while we're at it, let's talk about the EU, the French elections, the UK elections. Yeah. It, it's not the far right that's in command here. So, I mean, what should we expect NATO to do? We should expect NATO countries to step up and, and provide uh, uh, more of their G GDP for NATO. And they've done this. I think it was the number mm -hmm. was five or seven countries had spent 2% of, of, of GDP on NATO uh, when Biden took over. It's now 23 countries, seven to go, and some are well over 2%. Why does this matter? Because uh, Ukraine and Russia are in Europe's front door. And this is uh, existential for them. It matters to us, too. But you're talking about Trump-proofing NATO. If, if the countries step up, uh, that's, that's part way there, no matter what Trump does. But also, Congress passed a law, as I recall it, a few months ago that said uh, the U.S. could not mm -hmm. get out of NATO without congressional approval. And I don't think that's coming anytime soon. Approval for getting well, out. Well, let me ask you quickly. Yeah, you mentioned the French elections, and I'm glad you did, Jane. To what extent does that bring instability to these conversations at the NATO summit this week? Just the basic uncertainty that we're now looking at. Well, there's going to be a, a, uh, um, a hybrid combo government, but it, the, the far right is not going to play a big role. The isolationists did not win. And so, yes, uh, maybe France will move left, I would assume, on domestic policy. But I don't see any evidence that Macron's foreign policy is going to change uh, by this election result. And, uh, you know, I, I, some people think the French are difficult, but they certainly support uh, NATO and they support... Uh, uh, NATO's activities in Europe and the UK election, let's understand that, uh, most people think, is going to bolster NATO. So I think, I think the, and, and one more thing, the EU elections, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ursula von der Leyen is going to continue as EU president. This is another victory for the center, center slash left, and I think these are all good signs that Europe is going to be stable, and now we have to make sure America remains stable too. Jane Harmon, as we mark 75 years of NATO this week in the nation's capital. Thank you for being with us. Coming up, President Biden telling donors that he's here to stay, not just lawmakers. We'll take a look at what contributors from Hollywood to Wall Street are saying about where they're putting their money. The analysis is next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Almighty came out and said, Joe, get out of the race. I get out of the race. And Lord Almighty's not coming down. President Joe Biden is talking about what it might take for him to drop out of the race. In the interview on ABC News on Friday, maybe Jill Biden also on that list. Practically speaking, though, he needs the money to keep coming, too. And Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall has the latest for us on that front. Tyler? Yeah, hey, Joe. Bloomberg News is reporting President Biden spoke with top donors today on a phone call telling them, quote, I'm going to be the nominee of this party. 
It comes amid a recent backlash from some of the Democratic contributors, like the CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings, as well as Abigail Disney, the heir to the Walt Disney Company, who reportedly says she'll cut off donations unless Biden drops out. Then there's the billionaire founder of Galaxy Digital, Mike Novogratz, who hasn't donated to Biden's re-election campaign, but sources tell Bloomberg News is part of this effort to raise money for an alternate candidate. As for the president, he appeared to brush off all these concerns earlier today. I don't care what the millionaires think. And by the way, 97% of all the people who contribute to us would make people make it under 200, contribute under 200 bucks. I think we have the largest contingent ever in history. I'm not positive of that, but I think that's true. And so I want their support, but that's not the reason I'm running. I'm not running to, about what they think and what they care about. And by the way, you don't see a whole hell of a lot of them flocking to Trump. You don't see a whole lot of CEOs flocking to Trump. For former President Trump's part, he was in Washington last month meeting with, pri meeting with CEOs privately at the business roundtable. He's clinched support from some, like Blackstone CEO Stephen Schwartzman, and he has others, like Citadel's Ken Griffin, mulling a donation. Griffin fell short of an endorsement in a conversation with Bloomberg TV in May, but he did have this to say. If, if President Trump returns to the White House, I think you'll see a global perception of a stronger America. Now, the Biden administration's foreign policies, the actual policies are generally speaking thoughtful. But to be blunt, America does not, does not, does not exude credibility or strength in its actions around the world today. One of the reasons President Biden might be appearing to shrug off donor concerns is he has a lot of money in the vault. The latest numbers show $240 million in cash on hand. The Biden campaign says it raised $127 million in June, about 30 percent of which was raised in the four days between debate day and the end of the month. Still, Joe, the president needs big money to keep flowing in, particularly as the Trump campaign puts up big totals month after month. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall. Bloomberg, uh, Tyler, thank you so much for the update here as we continue to gauge support from within the Democratic Party here for President Biden. We have an important conversation coming up here. Congressman Jake Auchincloss, a Democrat from Massachusetts, will join us next with big questions today on what will happen when lawmakers get back together tomorrow. We heard from a big one today. The ranking member on the Armed Services Committee a short time ago, Adam Smith, a Democrat, the most senior of the House Democratic Caucus, to call on Joe Biden to drop out of the race. And we'll be talking with Jake Auchincloss coming up next here on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is not just about whether he gave it the, the best college try, but rather whether he made the right decision to run or to pass the torch. Voters do have questions, and uh, personally, um, I love Joe Biden. I don't know that the interview on Friday night did enough to answer those questions. We don't oppose the president. We simply ask him to make the very uh, important decision of stepping aside. Mr. President, your legacy is set. We owe you the great... Congressman Adam Schiff of California, Senator Chris Murphy uh, of Connecticut there, Congressman Lloyd Dodgett of Texas, and Congressman Mike Quigley of Illinois, Democrats, all publicizing their concerns following President Biden's debate performance. Meantime, the president reaffirming today that he's staying in the race as he has done through a couple of different interviews now, and in fact, a letter to the Democratic conference in the House. Receiving that letter among his colleagues, Democratic Congressman Jake Auchincloss, of Massachusetts, known to be an ally uh, of Joe Biden. And Congressman, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming in. We talked a lot uh, during the withdrawal from Afghanistan. You were the president's staunch supporter and defender at that point in time. You've even become known as the Fox Whisperer in some Democratic circles. Do you still have Joe Biden's back? 
Joe Biden's been a terrific president. It's going to go down top 10 all time, I think. He took office. The economy was flat on its back. 15 million jobs, 18 million small business applications. He's restored U.S. global leadership, gotten us out of a failed forever war, defended Ukraine, strengthened Taiwan. Uh, walked a tightrope in the Middle East to help Israel maintain its security uh, and invested in this country, infrastructure, manufacturing. Uh, so I'm always going to have the president's back because he's been a darn good president. At the same time, uh, it's not so much my opinion, it's Pennsylvania's opinion and Michigan's opinion and Wisconsin's opinion that's going to decide this thing. And failure is not an option in November. So Democrats are going to have hard conversations this week, but we are going to drive through to unity and to conviction on the other side so that we can rally around the top of the ticket. Well, I know there's an important meeting of House Democrats tomorrow. You'll all get together uh, with the leader, as I know many of you did virtually uh, last evening. What's going to come of this meeting? Are you suggesting that there'll be a show of hands on what to do with the president here? I don't know, but we have the very capable, competent leadership of Hakeem Jeffries, who has been consulting widely and who I think knows that it's not just about the White House, which of course is critical. It's also about the House of Representatives, the firewall for democracy, because ultimately in January 2025, it's either Hakeem Jeffries with the gavel or it's Mike Johnson, the man who architected the legal challenge against certifying Joe Biden's election results. So we could have a built in coup if we lose the House in November. And I know Hakeem Jeffries takes that very seriously. It's interesting to hear from the president earlier today. He called into MSNBC uh, to talk about this, having sat for the interview with George Stephanopoulos, did some events over the weekend in uh, Wisconsin and Philadelphia, and it still didn't seem to be enough addressing the concerns about his cognitive ability. Congressman, here's what he said, and we'll have you respond. In terms of my neurological capacity, I had a physical, a neurological physical as well in February. It's released. I released all my records, all of them, all of them. And I have a neurological test every single day. Try sitting behind this desk and making these decisions. You know it. Both of you know it. They know it. I'm not bad at what I do. And now, it doesn't mean I never make a mistake. I do. But I'm making those decisions. Congressman, he says every day at work is a cognitive test. And I, I don't know, but I guess I can relate. I feel like that every day when I work through this program. But should a cognitive test be mandatory for all presidential candidates over a certain age? I would like to see it become convention that every candidate for president submits to an independent, transparent neurological examination, the same way that it's convention that candidates submit their tax returns, because the American public deserves to know both potential conflicts of interest financially, but also potential neurological impairments, and, and vote accordingly. I think that's fair game. I think that's a salient voting issue. Uh, Joe Biden, uh, I think, to date, has been... Uh, clear that he puts the country's interests before his own. I trust him to continue to doing that. What I don't trust is for Donald Trump to continue doing that, which is why we need the same interrogation of Donald Trump that Joe Biden uh, has been withstanding this last week. Why isn't the GOP mm -hmm. asking Donald Trump to step aside ahead of their convention? I mean, Donald Trump just refused to accept the election results yet again. And, I mean, we know what happened last time he did that. Police officers died in the line of duty. Adam Smith, as I mentioned, the top ranking Democrat on the Armed Services Committee, publicly now calling for Joe Biden to drop out of the race. Congressman, I wonder what that means for you, not so much as a politician, but as a Marine who served in combat. As a Marine who served in combat, I trust Joe Biden as the commander in chief. He has scored numerous national security and foreign policy objectives in his term in office, uh, rallying South Korea and Japan to uh, ally themselves against the belligerents of China, signing an AUKUS deal with Australia to improve our nuclear submarine fleet in the Indo-Pacific, engaging with the Global South, uh, rallying NATO in Europe to the defense of Ukraine against the depredations of Russia. Uh, he is fighting on all fronts. He's doing so successfully. Uh, and I think he has every ability and every confidence to continue to be commander in chief in this term. Do you believe Joe Biden, and I, I feel your support here, Congressman, and it also sounds like you're open-minded based on what the caucus determines here this week. Do you believe Joe Biden when he says he's the only person who can beat Donald Trump? There are no indispensable men in politics. And uh, I think a whole bevy of Democratic candidates could beat Donald Trump because ultimately 
the best candidate against Donald Trump is Donald Trump himself. He is historically unpopular. A majority of Americans are desperate to avoid another dose of him, and that's because they're clear right about what he's offering. He's offering more constitutional uh, discord. He's offering to politicize basic services like the IRS and Social Security. He's offering to attack abortion medication and individual freedoms. This is not a term that Americans want to sign up to. There have been questions about whether Joe Biden uh, should go to Capitol Hill himself tomorrow to make an in-person appearance. It came up a few times during the White House press briefing today. Congressman, should he? I would welcome it. I'm going to be there. Certainly, I think the president would, would uh, have a rapt audience. A rapt audience that will already be talking about this. And so we'll get back to where we started at the beginning here. This is a family conversation, as I think you're indicating. What's the plan for tomorrow when you go behind closed doors? I, I think members are trying to synthesize a number of different threads. One is that 14 million Democrats went to the polls, had a contested, open primary election and said, Joe Biden's our guy to defeat Donald Trump. And I take that very seriously as an elected official. I believe in free and fair elections. The other is that constituents have expressed concerns since the debate. And those, consi those constituents deserve the dignity of clarification and, and uh, of response. And also that we have to look at the battleground states and, and where the president stands there and make sure that the, that the top of our ticket is truly equipped to defeat Donald Trump because giving it your all is not acceptable. Winning is the only acceptable outcome. Congressman, it's good to have you back. Welcome back to Washington. Hope you had a good fourth. Jake Auchincloss, the Democrat from Massachusetts, with us on Balance of Power. Coming up, we turn back to the race for the White House. President Biden's next move with our political panel. Their view next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. If you stay in and Trump is elected and everything you're warning about comes to pass, how will you feel in January? I feel as long as I gave it my all and I did the goodest job as I know I can do. That's what this is about. President Biden talking on Friday with ABC's George Stephanopoulos, the big interview that was supposed to end it all. That's why he ended up on the phone today with MSNBC, the president calling into Morning Joe, getting pressed on that answer. You were asked the question, mm. uh, how would you feel if Donald Trump beat you? How would you feel after you lost? And you said, well, as long as I did the best I could do, uh, that's, the, that's the most important thing. That's caused Democrats concern who believe <laughs> that, that losing is not an option. What would you say to those who are concerned by that answer? It's not an option. And I've not lost. I haven't lost. I beat him last time. I'll beat him this time. Joining us now, our political panel with Kristen Hahn, Democratic strategist, partner at Rock Solutions, alongside Lisa Camuso Miller, former RNC communications director and host of the Friday Reporter podcast. Great to see you both here. Strangely, we're talking about the same thing we were last time you were here. This has been a long couple of weeks for Joe Biden. Kristen, you were with us in our special coverage the night of the debate. What do you think about that exchange right now and how alarmed are Democrats who were surely blowing up your phone all weekend? I mean, I think that was that was it, doing we need our best is winning. I mean, not just beating Trump, which is a matter of domestic and national security, as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, um, but also uh, winning the House. And we all know the effect that the top of the ticket can have on the down ballot uh, races. So I think that's why you see a lot of these members who are concerned. And uh, doing our best means winning. Yeah. So um, nothing, nothing short of that. This is really interesting as we've now settled on the House as, uh, as the real center of action here. And of course, you know a lot about that, Lisa, having worked for a former speaker. The president tried to head off the salvo with his own. He sent a letter to House Democrats this morning telling them to knock it off, that he's staying in the race, that he won the primaries fair and should look to voters at this time who've already made their statement. But we just heard from Adam Smith, the top ranking Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. I wonder how many you think we'll hear from in the days ahead and how important the House will be in terms of playing a role in the president's decision. 
Oh, I think it's critical, and I think Kristen and I were just talking about that before we joined you, is that this is now, it's going to be a really telling tomorrow to see how many people are going to have hard feelings, having come back from the district, mm -hmm. having now talked to a lot of their constituents to get a sense of how things are outside of Washington, D.C., and that's when you really get a sense of how bad things are. Regardless of what the president is saying, even though we were... Uh, seeing that he was the nominee through the primary process, there is definitely some a lack of trust in the president and the White House and the campaign on the Democrat side mm. because no one really was seeing this side of Joe Biden until two Thursdays ago. And that, I think, mm. is the one that really has people asking a lot more questions these days. Well, there's a little bit of a where have you guys been here as well. Every poll has shown great concerns about Joe Biden's age. I realize some were surprised to see what they saw in the debate. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the House now because they woke up that Friday morning and thought, oh my gosh, maybe we're not going to flip the chamber. Is it as simple as that? I, I don't think that they were seeing it for the first time. I think that they haven't been you know, very vocal about it. But like you said, the, the voters we've seen in poll after poll after poll are concerned about you know both candidates' age, mm -hmm. um, in, including President Biden, um, and so a lot of that criticism, if you want to kind of flip this argument on its head, yeah. is baked in a little bit uh -huh. here. Um, so there are voters who know that he is is older, yeah. and they are still not. They, there's no way they can go vote for President Trump, which is a lot of uh, I think what the campaign is saying. Sure. I mean, you know, this is a baked in argument. How many Jake Auken clauses does he have, though? I mean, clearly behind the president unless and until he says otherwise. Yeah, so I think um, there are there are many on, on different sides of this. I think you should look at the districts that they're coming from. Mm -hmm. But like Lisa said, they will have just been coming off of doing a ton of events in the district. They've been home for a while. They've been talking to their constituents, listening to them. And when they come back to to D.C., they're, they're on the floor together. They yep. have the caucus meetings together, and then they all can kind of start moving in a direction. So I think it's going to be very telling tomorrow. We could be, according to Bloomberg's report, talking about dozens of Democrats potentially signing a letter tomorrow. And you know what we haven't been talking about at all this whole hour, I think? Donald Trump, which is remarkable. And the point here, he's been incredibly restrained, dare I say disciplined, in letting Joe Biden deal with this all on his own. Not only that, though, the, they, the Republican National Committee also released the, the what's the platform for the convention next yes, week. Yes, they sure did. And that also was a lot less conservative in voice <clears throat> and in narrative than it has been in the past. It looked like a Trump post on Truth Social, and was, even also, in all caps. To, but, but also to, to that point, it's also felt like a little bit of a nod to the middle mm -hmm. where they talk less about a national abortion ban and they talk less about um, some of the extreme language that you've he been hearing out of the Republican Party. Sure. And so that, too, I think, is also a move to the middle and a move in a way that might also do more harm to the Democratic ticket than than we may have anticipated before. Pretty fascinating. We're going to talk more uh, ahead about the Veep stakes and the Republican convention coming up next week. The party elders in this case, the Barry Goldwater, would be whom? Is Barack Obama? Who knocks on the door at the White House if, in fact, we are in a world in which the Democratic Party has decided Joe Biden's not their nominee. I mean, I think, you know, you're, that's a discussion that they will have, and I think there are a lot of people that the president listens to now, including yeah. his family. But I will say the Republicans had the same platform the last time around, and it was um, a lot of smoke and mirrors about what exactly these, these members are talking about doing if they have control of everything. So it's mm -hmm. smart from having, you know, Trump not saying so much and actually having, you know, putting out this these seven or eight or nine bullet points, whatever it was, it's the least offensive thing we can do. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, Donald Trump, if he is reelected, it will be devastating. Well, there is travel now on the calendar for Joe Biden next week. He's going to be in Texas, mm -hmm. going to be in Nevada. Yep. Does he need to stay on the road as long as Donald Trump's in Milwaukee? I think he needs to stay on the road and, you know, do what he did over the last couple of days and give strong performances and speeches and, and speak to the people. I mean, he's going to the yeah. LBJ school and my, yes. my alma mater of the University of Texas. So I'm excited about that to see what um, he's going to do. But he has to project strength going forward for sure. What else do you do? You sat down with Stephanopoulos Friday. You called into Morning Joe today. A couple of events. One had a teleprompter. A few of them didn't. Do you just start picking up the phone every day like Trump and hitting morning shows until people believe you? You know, I, I, unfortunately, as much as I agree to some degree with what Kristen just said about the two parties and the, the 
Republican Party, I will say that there is a greater risk for Joe Biden to do more and more and more because he is no question in the minds of voters one way or the other. He is likely to stumble again. And that will be the narrative, regardless of how many positive interactions he has. If he stumbles once, that will be the one oh, stepping yeah. stone that he'll yeah. have to get over. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is the risk he takes in being out more and more, which is, it sounds like the playbook for the for And then the you campaign. start a whole new series of interviews yeah. and speeches right. to show people that you're up to the job. That's right. Pretty interesting. With Lisa and Kristen, we're going to turn to the RNC, as I mentioned, next. We're in Milwaukee a week from today, and we expect to learn who Donald Trump will pick as his vice presidential nominee between now and then. Be back with our political panel next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. You're telling me right now that a second Trump uh, administration would not go after any Democrats, any of his political opponents, full stop. You can you have confidence that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, I, he was president before and he didn't do it then. He's already said that he wouldn't do that. He, he, he'll be too busy undoing all the damage of this disastrous presidency. Senator Marco Rubio on CNN yesterday doing Sunday morning television and answering questions about whether a Trump presidency would target political opponents. Rubio is one of the names being tossed around now for vice presidential consideration, a running mate for Donald Trump. As the Republican National Convention approaches, it starts one week from today in Milwaukee. And our political panel is back with us, Kristen Hahn and Lisa Camuso Miller, as we turn to the Veep stakes. Uh, this is fun to talk about especially in the final throes of the season here, Lisa. We're supposed to know between now and Monday. That would be tradition going into the convention. The Washington Post this morning comes out with the headline that it's down to two, Marco Rubio or J.D. Vance, with some mentions of Doug Burgum in the background. Is that how you see it? You know, I'd like to think that we could predict who this is going to be. But mm -hmm. if nothing else, Donald Trump has proven that he will always surprise you with what his choice is. So none of the above. So it could be any one of those three or <laughs> someone that comes from out of left field. Uh -huh. um, of those names, though, I would say that it's probably, if I were putting a dollar down with you, mm -hmm. I would say it would be J.D. Vance because Marco yeah. Rubio is from the same state. As He's got to move. And he'd have to move. And he claims and he, he hasn't thought that. about that, which yeah. I thought was interesting. <laughs> All right, strategy and timing here. Do you drop this at the end of the week? Do you wait for the convention to give people the reason to watch it? You wait for the you wait for the convention. Do it in Milwaukee. For certain. Yes. Okay. That's I mean that's my that's my anticipation is that they'll wait. Why would they announce something on a Friday? Uh, I mean, unless it's not great news. So the, sure. they want to ride that into they want to ride that wave right into the convention. They want to talk about the positivity. They want to take that momentum into Milwaukee and talk about how that ticket together is mm -hmm. going to be the winner. Or maybe you do a little leak on Thursday when this sitting president has the big news conference. A lot of folks, including myself, has framed this as the next big test for Joe Biden. Where's the strategy here with the veep stakes? I mean, I think it, I agree with Lisa. You know, th there's a constant battle here. Not yeah. who can who can take over the news uh, cycle in a in a positive way. Right, I think sure. you know one way Donald Trump could do that is to pick Christy Noem. You know, we all know that. <laughs> <laughs> not sure. <laughs> that's one thing happen. you can't do in politics is shoot puppies. Um, do you apparently. care as a Democrat, or it's all just the Trump ticket, and it doesn't matter who's running with him? Um, if it weren't those two people, I mean, it doesn't really matter. They're two extreme. Um, J.D. You know, Vance partisans. or Marco Rubio? Yes, I mean, they're both extreme. You see what Marco Rubio's done um, and gone along with in the state of Florida. J.D. Vance, I think, you know, the Democrats will be well positioned to, um, to go on the attack against either of those. Um, interesting when you consider the idea of running against him. How about a, a Sarah Huckabee Sanders or someone who hasn't been on the list? Are Democrats prepared for anything? Uh, yes, of course, we're prepared for anything. And I think it's interesting you bring up Sarah Huckabee Sanders. I think yeah. she definitely is on the road, wants to be president of the United States one day, and she's, I mean, I don't agree with pretty much anything she says, but she's hugely talented. I mean, yeah. I worked at, for a number of uh, elected officials in Arkansas, and she is quietly, I think, making moves. So that might be something, um, you know, that President Trump should look at. Fascinating. Um, a year, oh, well, gosh, a year ago, go back to 2016. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time ago. Donald Trump showed up, I think, every night at his convention. Are we going to see something like that in Milwaukee? 
I think that's very possible. He certainly likes to go to the party and he likes to be. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. So I, I would it's going to be interesting to see. But that seems to be in character with what he prefers. And he likes to be there. He likes to see people get excited, get excited uh -huh. about him. Yeah. And he it is really all about Donald Trump at the end of the day. So I suspect <laughs> that we probably will see him at Loves the convention. getting right on stage. He Lisa Camuso Miller, former RNC communications director, Kristen Hahn, partner, Rock Solutions. The convention starts a week from today, and we'll, of course, have special coverage and some fascinating conversations uh, from Milwaukee here starting on Monday. In the meantime, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online, and we'll meet you back here tomorrow. Kaylee will be with us on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.